Well, um, hello everyone and um, welcome to the session New Methods in Macroeconomics. Um, I'm James Mitchell and we've got three papers in this session. Firstly from Georgios Giorgiatis from the European Central Bank, then Karim Tzuglu from the Bank of Canada and then myself. And it's the usual format of half an hour of uh, a paper, 20 minutes for the presentations, a 10 minutes uh, Q&A for each paper. Um, and also to remind everyone, we have got the option at the end of this session, which I know will end sharply, of going into the coffee rooms to continue informally our conversations. So um, without further ado, let me pass over to um, Georgios. Thanks a lot, James. Um, thanks a lot for joining the session. The paper I'm presenting is about spillbacks from US monetary policy. And it's joint work uh, with Max Breitenlechner and Ben Schumann, uh, who might also be in the audience. Let me motivate this uh, paper by two observations. The first one is that there's a lot of literature, uh, which I'm not going to uh, talk about in more detail here, that documents that spillovers from US monetary policy to the rest of the world are large and uh, substantial. The second observation is, as you can see here from the quotes, there's a, there seems to be uh, an understanding that spillbacks from US monetary policy. So the spillovers that result from the spillovers um, from US monetary policy, the inward spillovers that result from the outward spillovers from US monetary policy are large as well. One example here is Stan Fisher in 2014 when he stated at the IMF annual meetings that actions taken by the Fed influence economic conditions abroad and because these international effects in turn spill back on the evolution of the US economy, the Fed cannot make sensible monetary policy choices without taking these spillovers into account. Then there are a couple of other statements by Janet Yellen in 2019 that mentions explicitly that spillbacks are large or Mark Carney at the um, uh, Jackson Hole uh, meetings in 2019 where he extends this argument to advanced economy monetary policies more generally. And then there's also uh, Hyung Song Shin in 2015 at the Fed conference, which doesn't mention explicitly spillbacks, but clearly has the same notion in mind. So uh, when you look at those quotes, you can really get the impression that there must be a lot of work that has documented that also spillbacks from US monetary policy are large. But when, when you actually go to the literature and you try to single out those papers, you don't find any of them. So our uh, reading of the literature is that there's nothing out there which focuses on quantifying spillbacks from US monetary policy. And that's what we're attempting in this paper. So that's the gap that we're trying to close with this paper. And more specifically, we carry out counterfactual analysis in Bayesian proxy structural VR models. Um, more specifically, even we consider structural scenario analysis and minimum relative entropy methods. I'm going to explain those in a little bit more detail later on. And we have three main findings. The first one is that spillbacks from US monetary policy, at least the way we conceive of them and the way we try to quantify them uh, seem to be uh, uh, large. Um, uh, specifically, we find that about half of the overall domestic output effect of US monetary policy uh, can be accounted for by spillbacks. Uh, the second finding is that these spillbacks do not materialize through trade, as you might be tempted to think a priori. They uh, materialize through stock market wealth effects that um, impinge on US households consumption and Tobin's Q effects that impinge on US firms uh, investment. And the third finding is that these spillbacks materialize much more through advanced economies rather than through emerging market economies. Although an important caveat is that our results are representative or indicative for whatever happened in the data over the last 30 years overall. Okay, so this uh, may be a little bit different at the current juncture. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes on conceptual considerations to um, convey how we conceive of spillbacks and how we uh, make use of counterfactual analysis in this, in this context. And then I'm going to show you the usual VR model specification and results. Okay, so to fix ideas, let's consider a <clears throat> two country new Keynes DSG model for the US and the rest of the world where there is trade in final goods only and where we assume for simplicity producer currency pricing. Now we could enrich uh, the model by more realistic features, but for the purpose um, that we use it here, this would just be a distraction. The argument that we want to get across would be the same. As you will see, spillovers from US monetary policy to the rest of the world in this uh, model materialize through trade, more specifically net exports and import prices. In the top row here, you see the impulse responses of US variables to a contractionary US monetary policy shock. In the bottom row, the responses of rest of the world variables. Now, okay, US policy rate rises, eventually US output drops. In the rest of the world, uh, there is a, a, an expansion in the very short term, 
uh, and also monetary policy tightening in the very short term. That is driven primarily by expenditure switching. You see in the last column, US exports and US imports, you see that US exports fall by much more than US imports. So US, export, US net exports fall uh, and as a mirror image, rest of the world net exports rise. And that at least in the short term leads to an expansion rest of the world output. Uh, monetary policy is not only tightened because of the expansion, uh, it's also uh, tightened because of the depreciation of the rest of the world currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. There's a rise in import prices due to producer currency pricing, which transmits to an increase in inflation. So this is super, super standard. Um, now, if we define spillbacks from U.S. monetary policy as the difference between the impulse responses of the U.S. variables that we just saw and a corresponding set of impulse uh, responses of US variables in a counterfactual version of the model, well, then the question is, of course, what's the counterfactual? What's the counterfactual version of the model? And it seems intuitive, and I'm emphasizing here, it seems intuitive that in this counterfactual model, we should assume that spillovers from US monetary policy to the rest of the world are absent, okay? And it also seems intuitive that this can be achieved by just precluding trade and raising home bias to unity. Okay. And this is because we just saw that spillovers materialize through trade. So if we shut down trade, we should be able to uh, shut down spillovers and hence spillbacks. So if we do this, uh, this is the result. The orange circle lines show you the impulse responses from this counterfactual version of the model where home bias is raised to one. You see that there are indeed no spillovers. And importantly, you see that the response of US output to a domestic monetary policy shock is weaker. It falls by less. Okay. And so based on this, we would conclude that spillbacks from US monetary policy in the baseline tend to amplify the domestic uh, output effects of US monetary policy. Okay, so far so good. But if you think a moment about this, then you realize, well, raising home buys to unity is really not the only way how you can preclude spillovers, right? And how you can benchmark spillbacks in that way. There are many other ways, even in this very stylized model, how you can achieve this. One is to just assume that the US is a small open economy. Now, if we do this, you get the blue squared lines. And if you look again at US output, then you see in this counterfactual version of the model in which the US assumed, is assumed to be a small open economy for the sake of precluding spillovers to the rest of the world, US output would actually respond more strongly than in the baseline, implying that the spillbacks would be assessed to be dampening in the baseline. Okay, so the point that we want to get across here is that from a theoretical perspective, it's really not obvious which counterfactual version of the model to choose if you're interested in assessing the magnitude of spillbacks. There's really no rigorous metric that guides the selection of this counterfactual model. It's impossible to tell whether it's more intuitive or more plausible to consider a counterfactual model in which the US is a small open economy or in which um, um, home bias is raised to, to, to unity. So what we are doing in this paper is that we consider an entire set of counterfactual models or an entire class of counterfactuals, uh, which is characterized by spillovers from US monetary policy to rest of the world output uh, being nil. Okay, so that's going to be the characterization of our uh, counterfactual models that we consider as a benchmark. It turns out that determining this set of counterfactual models is much easier in a VR framework than, than, than in a theoretical DSGE framework and that segues us nicely into the next section uh, where I lay out the specification of the, the VR framework. We consider the Bayesian proxy structural VR framework of Aridas et al, which has a couple of appealing features. Two of them are listed here. Uh, the first one is that we are able to identify multiple structural shocks with multiple proxy variables and proxy variables here means external instruments. Okay, this is a slightly different jargon. The second appealing feature is that on top of those structural shocks identified with proxy variables, we can also identify additional structural shocks with sign zero and magnitude restrictions. And we could do this in a way that allows coherent inference because this framework is fully Bayesian. Okay, so we identify three groups of shocks, both using proxy variables and sign restrictions and zero restrictions. Um, the first group, or in this case, it's a single shock, is the US monetary policy shock. That's our shock of interest, obviously. Okay, here we use proxy variable. As standard, uh, in the meantime, we use the high frequency interest rate surprises uh, around um, uh, FOMC announcement uh, days, um, cleansed by central bank information shocks, as has been done recently by, by some, including Yaroczynski and Karadi. The second shock is a global uncertainty shock. We identify this also using a proxy variable, namely gold price changes on narratively selected days that are arguably associated with global uncertainty shocks. The reason why we identify this shock is not so much because we're interested in its effects per se, but much more in order to make sure that the US monetary policy shock we identify and the third group of shocks that we identify are not contaminated by, by common global shocks, shocks that are common to the US and the rest of the world. 
And the third group of shocks we identified using sign restrictions. And these are shocks that we want to be specific to the rest of the world. And here we do not identify um, literally structural shocks. We identify two buckets of shocks, namely depreciating shocks and appreciating shocks, where this, of course, refers to the rest of the world exchange rate. And we argue that any possible rest of the world structural shock will fall into one of those two buckets. Okay, And we're identifying this third group of shock because we're going to use it for the counterfactual analysis. The VR specification is, is nothing um, uh, innovative. We just adopt the one from Gatlin Karadi. We add a couple of variables, as you will see, and we estimate this model over the last 30 years. These are the impulse responses to a US monetary policy shock identified by, by proxy variables. You see that the one-year treasury bill red rises, that's the monetary policy indicator. The dollar appreciates in effective terms. There's some delayed overshooting. US consumer prices fall. Uh, there seems to be a, a permanent fall. The excess bond premium tightens. The VXO increases temporarily. And we have a synchronized a drop in US and rest of the world industrial production, which testifies to this uh, wide, uh, widely uh, find, found a um, um, uh, piece of evidence that there are large spillovers from, from US monetary policy to the rest of the world. Okay, so, so far, nothing uh, innovative. Remember that we're interested in uh, quantifying the spillbacks from US monetary policy. And remember that the counterfactual constraint that we consider in order to tease out from the data the, the size of those spillbacks is that in this counterfactual, the output spillovers from US monetary policy to the rest of the world are, are nil. Okay. The idea of doing this or imposing this counterfactual constraint on the rest of the world output impulse responses is that in the process, we will be also be modifying the impulse responses of the other US variables in the VR model. And the extent to which we modify these impulse responses or to the extent that they change uh, will be indicative of the magnitude of spillbacks. We consider two approaches to obtain these counterfactual impulse responses. The first one is structural scenario analysis. And here the idea is to use the actual VR model Okay. to consider the impulse responses from the actual VR model, but to modify these impulse responses by allowing for a set of driving shocks to materialize along the impulse response horizon. Okay. And these driving shocks will have the property that they keep rest of the world output at baseline. Okay. So structural scenario analysis is a, is a point of contact with existing literature, which has used this using specific single driving shocks in order to impose the counterfactual constraint. And as you will see, we'll to extend this to just using all shocks in the VR model to be a bit more general. The second approach we consider is minimum relative entropy. Here, the idea is different from structural scenario analysis in that we're not using the actual VR model, but we're using or we're looking for an, an alternative VR model. And that alternative VR model has the property that it satisfies the counterfactual constraint that outputs below us from US monetary policy to rest of the world are nil. And what we're looking for here is the responses of uh, the other variables to the US monetary policy show. So minimum relative entropy has been used in the literature, but has been used so far to our knowledge only in the forecasting literature in order to incorporate restrictions implied by theory in order to improve a forecast. But if you if you see that impulse responses are based on conditional forecasts, then I think the, 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 the reason why it's appealing to use minimum relative entropy in this context is I think um, not, um, it's not difficult to see. Now we think that in terms of interpretation, at least uh, structural scenario analysis and minimum relative entropy are different and thereby complementary. And so that's why we have included both of these approaches in the paper. So here you see the results uh, from structural scenario analysis. In both panels, you see the impulse response from US industrial production to a contraction in US monetary policy shock. The black solid line is the baseline, okay, the unconstrained. Uh, response and the green squared line in the left hand side panel and the blue triangle line in the right hand side panel are the counterfactual impulse responses that we get when we allow driving shocks to materialize along the forecast horizon with a property that they will push back to zero the response of rest of the world output to the US monetary policy shock, okay, which is not shown here on this slide. So the difference between those two lines, the black solid line and in the left hand side panel, the green squared line is our assessment of the spillback. Okay. In the left-hand side panel, we use only these two rest of the world shocks, the appreciating and the depreciating shock as driving shocks. And in the right-hand side panel, we use all shocks in the VR model as driving shocks that enforce the counterfactual constraint on rest of the world output. As you can see, our assessment of the spillbacks from US monetary policy is that these are large, uh, essentially half of the trough response of US industrial production to the US monetary policy shock seems to be accounted for by the, uh, by the spillbacks. Here you see in the right-hand side panel, the results from the minimum relative entropy approach, which turns out to be very similar 
um, to the results from the structural scenario analysis. And so in the following, I'm just going to show you results from uh, the middle panel, from the approach in the middle panel, the structural sh uh, scenario analysis with all shocks. But uh, the understanding is, of course, that the results are very similar with the other approaches. OK, so uh, at first, this may seem surprising that the spillbacks are so large or account for such a large fraction of the overall domestic output response of US monetary policy. And so we uh, dig deeper in the paper in uh, terms of trying to understand the transmission channels for those spillbacks. And the first thing we do here is that we look please. at these. Yes, that we do, uh, that we look at the GDP components. And we see here that in terms of net exports, that doesn't seem to be uh, a relevant transmission channel because uh, the difference between baseline and counterfactual for exports and imports are very similar. In, instead, we find here that uh, the transmission of spillbacks must be materializing through consumption and investment. And so again, we dig deeper and we look at a couple of candidate transmission channels that are listed here could be that they're in the counterfactual, there is a weaker tightening of US financial conditions, and so on and so forth. And we reflect each of those candidate channels with one variable that we tack on to the VR and redo our analysis, both the estimation and the counterfactual analysis. OK, so in here, uh, on this slide, you have uh, the results. The first four variables that we tack on to the VR, excess bond premium, which is actually already there in the VR, consumer confidence, the one-year treasury bill rate, and macro uncertainty, those variables do not display significant systematic differences across the baseline and the counterfactual. So the channels reflected by these variables do not seem to be relevant for the transmission of spillbacks. Instead, it seems that equity prices play a crucial role where we see big differences between the baseline and the counterfactual. Uh, Dow Jones world in the top right-hand side panel and the Dow Jones excluding the US in the bottom right-hand side panel. So we conclude from this one that for consumption, for use consumption, the spillbacks must be materializing through stock market wealth effects that operate in the holdings of US residents of foreign, foreign stock. And then we have a long discussion in the paper of various points that substantiate um, uh, this interpretation, referring to hang models and the role of uh, wealth effects in monetary policy transmission, a discussion of uh, micro evidence on the composition of US household portfolios, macro evidence on the elasticity of consumption to stock market wealth, and also some uh, discussion of stylist facts that comes uh, that that, that comes to the conclusion that a large share of US uh, stock holdings are actually foreign stocks, but I don't have the time to go into details here. Then we move to investment. And here we look at the response of uh, the valuation of US firms that have a high and a low exposure to the rest of the world in terms of sales. And we find in the bottom row that especially firms which have a high exposure to the rest of the world display differences, large differences across baseline and uh, counterfactual in terms of the response of their valuation. That transmits to uh, differences in the response of um, earnings expectations, which you can see in the top right-hand side uh, corner across the baseline and the counterfactual. And so we conclude here that spillbacks from US monetary policy to US investment must be materializing through token skew effects you know, relating to the ratio of the market price of capital relative to the, to the replacement uh, price. OK, so there's more uh, that I have to skip. The final thing that we look at is uh, at transmission channels, not in, terms, in economic terms, but in regional and geographic terms. And here we're asking whether these spillbacks materialize more through advanced or more through emerging market economies or both. And what we do here is three things. First, we replace rest of the world industrial production by uh, advanced and emerging market industrial production. We put this jointly together in the VR and we redo our analysis. And then we ask, okay, how do we get closer to our baseline counterfactual results by switching off spillbacks and spillovers through and to advanced economies, but allowing for spillbacks and spillovers through emerging market economies or the reverse, okay? The results, is here. the results are here. Again, you see the response of US industrial production to uh, kind of, through con contraction of US monetary policy shock. The black solid line is the baseline response. And uh, the light shaded blue uh, triangle line is in both cases, the let's say the baseline assessment of the spillbacks, what we get for the response of US industrial production if we shut down spillovers from US monetary policy to the entire rest of the world, both advanced economies and emerging market economies. In the left-hand side panel, the dark shaded uh, cross blue line shows you what we get if we shut down only spillovers and spillbacks to advanced economies, but we leave unconstrained the spillovers and spillbacks from emerging market economies. And you see that in this case, we actually get quite close to the um, uh, counterfactual response of US industrial production that we get if we shut down spillovers and spillbacks to the entire rest of the world. And that's already indicative that 
uh, advanced economies must be playing uh, an important role in the transmission of uh, spillbacks to the US economy. Right hand side panel, um, we conclude this by uh, seeing that when we shut down only spillovers and spillbacks to emerging market economies, but not to advanced economies, then what we get is actually for the then what we get for the response of US industrial production is actually very close to the completely unconstrained uh, result. So it must be in this case that emerging market economies uh, do not play a large role for the transmission of the spillbacks from US monetary policy. Again, an important caveat, uh, and here is some data that we discussed in the, in the paper uh, on the relative importance of advanced and emerging market economies in, in US as financial and trade integration with the rest of the world. An important caveat is again that of course our results are uh, representative for the last 30 years overall and they don't speak um, to the question what what happens at the current juncture. Okay, so let me conclude. There's a large literature that documents that spillovers from US monetary policy are large. This has uh, been associated with complaints, especially from emerging market policymakers, that these spillovers complicate macro and financial management in their jurisdictions. In other words, that they present trade-offs and hence externalities. In turn, the Fed has claimed on various occasions that it does take into account, it does internalize those externalities in the rest of the world because um, uh, its spillovers create generate spillbacks. And this uh, impinges on the Fed's um, monetary policy uh, stance. But if you look in the literature, there's actually not really work that documents the magnitude of those spillbacks. And so we try to fill this gap uh, and we find that spillbacks are indeed large, that they materialize not through trade, but through stock market wealth effects and Tobin's Q effects in consumption and investment in the US, and that they rise much more through advanced economies than through emerging market economies, at least over the entire sample period that we look at. And especially the latter has important implications that need to be followed up uh, in, in future work for the desirability of international monetary policy coordination. And then I'll stop here and I, I hope I'm still in time. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. It's very good timekeeping. Thank you. Um, so we've got some time for some questions now. So please um, make use of the Q&A box, um, everyone. Uh, so I'll keep my eyes peeled on that for questions as they um, come in. But perhaps while I Give, give everyone a bit of time to type in their question. Shall I, uh, I'll start myself with, a, um, I've got a couple written down here, but let me start with the first one and, see, and keep my eye on the chat box. Um, Georges, you, as I understood it, um, are focusing on what an older literature might have called exogenous monetary policy shocks in the US. Um, you know, I wondered, is there a role in explaining your spillbacks for the rest of the world reacting to endogenous monetary policy at the Fed. In other words, you know, they know the Fed or they can see the Fed's about to raise interest rates because inflation's going up. And so they anticipate that. So in other words, you know, is there something in that endogenous component to monetary policy that that you're missing or, or are you capturing that in some way that perhaps I didn't uh, didn't pick up? Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, I think there are different ways to interpret your question, but I think uh, the way I would interpret is, is um, in the same way as you would ask the question uh, in a US only analysis on how much we can learn about the effects of endogenous, of systematic US monetary policy by looking at exogenous monetary policy variation. Would that be a fair understanding of your question? Yeah, no, that's right, that's right. 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 And so I guess the, I mean, I, I, I think I'll just join the chorus here and I would say, well, um, whatever we estimate as a response to exogenous monetary policy movements is actually really indicative of um, uh, what's happening in response to systematic monetary policy. There's this long and famous conversation between uh, Ruda Bush and, and Sims, I think it was in the European Economic Review, where Sims makes this very illustrative uh, point that if you look at um, if you want to identify, let's say, a, a demand curve, you know, you can use exogenous changes in supply, right? And you'll still see the systematic relationship uh, uh, for the, that re that's reflecting demand, even if you're just using exogenous variation um, in, in the supply curve. So I, I think that, that, that that's my response, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's very good. Thank you. Um, so let me, um, again, keeping an eye on the Q&A box, follow up with my... Uh, Second question. Um, your sample period I th I th um, was sort of 1990 through to 2019, um, if I'm <laughs> if I've remembered correctly. I just wondered, and in, in, in you're obviously finding um, that the emerging economies aren't having perhaps as proving the spillbacks aren't as important as you might have anticipated. I wondered whether there's some sort of perhaps time variation going on in, in the, I mean, you've got a relatively short sample period, but 
but arguably perhaps the you know the spillbacks to China or some of these emerging economies have become uh, larger in the latter half of your sample. I wondered whether you'd look for these sort of temporal uh, instabilities one way or another. <laughs> I mean, this is a great question. I think this is a, a, a great thing to to pursue in, in follow up work. I mean, here you see on this slide, you see these uh, stylized facts. Uh, notice in the top panel, the, the time um, uh, on the X axis. So you see here the, the composition of the US foreign portfolio investment equity in terms of um, destinations, uh, financial centers, emerging market economies, advanced economies, you see that clearly advanced economies have been dominating, but uh, the share of advanced economies has been falling over time. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, extrapolating from this, I would assume that these spillbacks materializing through emerging market economies have been have become much more important uh, more recently. And so I guess um, if there is a way that we could analyze some time variation with this relatively short um, data set, I guess we should do it. I'm not sure if it's something we should do in this paper, but it's definitely very relevant from a policy perspective. Yeah. Yeah, very good. And I definitely agree. Uh, it'd be, for, be for another paper, that's for sure. You've got, you got a good contribution, a lot going on in this paper already. Um, I see we've just got a question in from Peter Mayer. So if we could please unmute um, Peter and he can put his question directly to Georgios, please. US interest rates have been very low in the recent COVID period. And I wonder, in simple terms, how extreme are the impulse response functions implied by those rates, e either in terms of, of flows of money or relative to the standardized shock? Right, so I think that's a very good question as well. Uh, I can, on top of my head, I can think of two points. The first one is, is very defensive, but still I think it's worthwhile being mentioned. Our sample period obviously doesn't include the COVID period. So whatever we find is not, I think it would be unfair to say that our findings are also reflective representative of what monetary policy, how monetary policy was behaving, responding during the COVID period. It's a defensive answer, but anyways. Then the second thing is, uh, as so many, you know, so much work in the literature using um, uh, linear VR models, we're really not able to capture any non-linearities, time variation, uh, asymmetries in responses that, that may be uh, empirically relevant. So I, I have to be a, a silent uh, on this one. I mean, there are methodologies we could apply in order to explore this, but I guess we cite here with a large uh, literature that just uses um, linear VR models. Yep. Okay, thank you, Georgios. Thank you. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, so we'll pass over to um, Kareem now, please. But to remind everyone that we have got the coffee break, um, uh, virtual coffee break at the end of this session. So if people got further com um, questions or want to pick up pick up any of the conversations, then please do join that um, coffee break. But over over to you now, please, uh, Kareem. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, so first, I'd like to express my gratitude to the organizers. Uh, for including our paper, and thank you for everyone joining. Uh, I'll talk about measuring aggregate and sectoral uncertainty. This is a joint work with Efrem Castelnuovo from University of Padova and Luis Buzeda from Bank of Canada. And the views expressed here are only ours and do not reflect necessarily the position of the Bank of Canada. So the world has been going through extreme uncertainty, as we all know. But uncertainty is not a new concept. Uh, Actually, it's been, uh, it's been a hot topic uh, since the Great Recession, and we see countless of studies on uncertainty. Um, because uncertainty, the definition of uncertainty is not that clear, and it's also not clear uh, how to measure the uncertainty, there are countless of studies. They all are very valuable and capturing probably different types of uncertainties. And uh, there's a uh, list of uh, some, some papers that are measuring the uncertainties, like Bloom's 2009 seminal paper, uh, his stock market volatility, or Gerardo Ludwig's and Inc, um, their uh, macroeconomic uncertainty, and then they have uh, also uh, financial uncertainty. And so there are many papers, uh, as you can see, but they are mostly uh, predominantly focusing on the aggregate measure measures of uncertainty. So they are silent on the, what's, what's going on in the sectoral side. Uh, 
But we know that especially from the, like if you consider COVID uh, pandemic, sectors usually face additional sector specific uncertainty shocks. For instance, the transportation sector, the retail stores or the healthcare. We know that the uncertainty they face is above and beyond the aggregate uh, uncertainty. So we know that in general, aggregate uncertainty is counter cyclical and contractionary. That's what the literature found. But we don't know much about the sectoral uncertainty and how is it different from the aggregate one. Uh, so the literature uh, has given some answers to this question. The first of all, the first part of the uh, one branch of the literature focuses on the general sectoral dynamics. And then they ask the question, are they important? And the answer is yes. Uh, for instance, the, the first part here is the first Sartre and Watson, Atalai and Guardian Prison and Sims. They find that the, during the great moderation, uh, uncertainty declined, the volatility declined, we know that, but it declined only in the aggregates and the sector specific uh, volatilities, they didn't decline. So which means that since starting with the great moderation sector, specific shocks are actually more important uh, than the aggregate ones, relatively speaking. And there are other papers that are looking at the um, importance of the sectors, and they find that the sectors actually can generate macro tail risk during the sessions. Or just because sectors are small, you it doesn't mean that we need to or we can um, ignore them because micro shocks to these sectors may not average out, and they can actually generate um, the basic, they can actually generate like aggregate effects and because of the nonlinear nature. Uh, of the input output, for instance, um, like linkages. But when we look at specifically the, the sectoral uncertainty on the uncertainty front, the empirical evidence is scanned. So to the best of our knowledge, we found only three papers that are looking at the uh, uncertain sectoral uncertainties. And the first one is Churi and Lungani. They look at the effects of sector level uncertainty on unemployment. They find that uh, the responses of the unemployment is different. Uh, to the sector level uncertainty compared to the aggregate one. And then Siegel 2019 showed that the consumption investment uh, uncertainty shocks have different implications for the economy. And finally, Ma and Samaniego, uh, they find that the aggregate and sectoral uncertainty based on median forecast areas of earning uh, per share ratios, and then they analyze the responses of different uh, variables to these uh, uncertainty shocks. And our paper, while is in line with uh, most of these, they actually, uh, our paper differs uh, in, in a few uh, significant ways from the literature. First of all, we are uh, estimating the aggregate and sector specific uncertainties jointly. This is a very important uh, difference because if you just simply look at an uncertainty in a sector, you don't know how much of it is coming from the aggregate uncertainty and how much of it is coming from only uh, specific to the sector. This is important because then the rest of the results will be contaminated probably by the aggregate uncertainty. And the second of all, since we are doing a, a estimating or measuring these uncertainties in one step, we are also avoiding um, a potential biases due to the generated regressor problem, where in some of these papers, they are having multiple steps of estimation. So at the end of the uh, all the steps, we don't know really um, how much the inferences are reliable. So overall, our contributions are threefold. So we provide an empirical framework that allows for joint estimation of aggregate and sector specific uncertainty. And we are using a large data set. And we provide new measures of uh, aggregate and sector specific uncertainties. And then finally, we show that how heterogeneous uh, they are. All of the sector specific or sector uncertainties are actually, they are behaving different. They are evolving different over time. And not only that, but their roles as a driver of business cycle is different. So they have different uh, real effects. So let me start with the data before I move to the uh, model, because this is going to help, uh, help us understand the model better. So we are using the US industrial production data between 1972 Q1 and 2019 Q3. Uh, we stopped the data before the COVID to show that our method works in normal times, but then we also are going to extend it in, uh, in the following sections to the COVID era as well to say something about how uncertainty evolved during the pandemic. Uh, for those who are familiar with the paper, first there at all, uh, they are using similar data. We just extended their uh, data set and then uh, in terms of both uh, cross section and time horizon. So finally, we have 212 industries under four sectors. So just not to let uh, anyone be confused, 
I'm using the terminology as the industry is a subset of a sector. So sector is the bigger group uh, consisting of industries. So at the end, we have uh, four sectors that contain the following number of industries, as you can see in the table, and consisting the total of 212 industries. Uh, at the end of the day, we will be estimating one aggregate or common uncertainty uh, that's common to all of these industries and then four sector specific volatility factors. So our uh, model is a dynamic uh, factor model with common uh, stochastic volatility. Uh, in terms of the measurement equation, uh, we have a, a dynamic factor uh, in the conditional mean, which I will talk about it soon. But then the most interesting part is going on in the conditional volatility part of the measurement equation. So we have the sigma T matrix that captures the stochastic volatility component. And this is where our measure of uncertainty is coming. So we are in line with uh, Jura de Lutingson Inc. Um, and his, uh, their followers in the, in the literature. We say that the uncertainty is measured through the unpredictable component. Uh, so we are capturing uh, with the dynamic factors as uh, to the best of our knowledge. And in the unpredictable component, we are looking at the stochastic volatility and then naming them as our uncertainty measures. And then we are allowing for outliers and by actually uh, in, uh, putting some psi t's, which is a latent, latent scaling factors that turns the Gaussian errors ETs into the student T um, distributed errors. So therefore we are capturing the outliers and this also reduces the maybe erroneously um, putting uh, more emphasis on the stochastic volatility by capturing the outliers. And then uh, finally, the, the factors, the dynamic factors in the conditional mean, they, are, they follow a VAR model and then they have their own stochastic volatility as well. And this hopefully captures the, uh, any potential bias that we might attribute to, the, to our uh, uncertainty measures. And then let me show you how we are decomposing the uncertainty, the HTs, uh, the stochastic volatilities into aggregate and sector specific ones. So HTs is a um, stochastic volatility of an industry. And then we just decompose it into two components. The first one is an aggregate uh, volatility. And the second one is the sector specific volatility. And then we allow them uh, to be to form a VAR model so that we actually allow for uh, uncertainty spillovers uh, through this VAR, but only with lags. So in the contemporaneous uh, part of the uncertainty, we say that uh, an uncertainty of an industry can belong to either the aggregate uncertainty or it comes from the sector specific uncertainty where the, that industry belongs to. So the, at the end of the day, VTA, uh, the aggregate uncertainty is common to all industries, but VTS is common only to those industries that are in the, within a sector. So one reason, for instance, why we are not allowing here an idiosyncratic component for each industry is that it's gonna make the computation probably infeasible because uh, in a large scale uh, data that we are using, we need, it means that we need to introduce 212 more uh, state variables, which we need to estimate, and that's gonna make probably the computation infeasible. Um, so let me show you uh, my, uh, our aggregate uncertainty. So here, there are a few, uh, two important uh, facts here. First of all, we see a large spikes during the uh, recession. So it means that uh, our aggregate uncertainty is also uh, counter cyclical. And we see a clear reduction in the uncertainty uh, starting with the period that's so-called the great moderation. So these are the two most important um, uh, takeaways from this uh, picture and we didn't plot it together with other some famous uh, uncertainty measures but it's pretty much in line and I will show you the correlation coefficients with those uh, soon. Let's move on to the sector specific uncertainty measures. So these are the uh, sector specific uncertainty measures belonging to energy, utilities, non-durables and then durable sectors. So there are some striking results here. First of all, they all are different uh, so they don't look alike. And second of all, the great moderation is not that clear. Uh, yes, it's clear, for instance, in the durable sector, but it's not clear there is almost no great moderation in, in many of the other uh, sector specific uncertainties. And it's also not clear that they are spiking at the recessions. So by, by uh, I'm gonna look at the condition uh, correlations here uh, to show you guys that the cyclicality and then the, uh, how they are moving with the other uh, variables. So first of all, uh, 
in this plot, we are showing the correlations uh, with some um, selected macroeconomic and financial variables, as well as some other famous uh, uncertainty measures. And the correlations are uh, with, with our uh, uncertainty measures. So as you can see, uh, the, our aggregate uncertainty is highly counter uh, cyclical. Uh, so is our uh, durables uncertainty. But the cyclicality of other uh, uncertainty measures is not so clear. So some of them are acyclical, some of them are even procyclical. And if you look at the correlation with the recession dates, for instance, the correlation of aggregate and durables uncertainty is very high with the recessions, again, uh, showing the counter cyclicality. And thus, there are some other, some famous uncertainty measures in the literature, like the Jurado Ludwigs and Inc. or uh, Ludwigs and Ma and Inc., real uncertainty and financial uncertainty, as well as the VIX and the economic policy uncertainty. So we see that our aggregate and durables uncertainties are highly correlated with the uh, other macro related uncertainties, but much less correlated with the financial side. So this, these are uh, showing you the correlations uh, between the some macro variables and then uh, showing you what the unconditional correlations are doing. But if we con look at the conditional correlations, for instance, uh, we are going to revisit the Girardot Ludwigs and Inc. paper, and especially we will uh, replicate their results, and then uh, we will replace the, our uncertainty measures in their framework. And specifically, we use 11 variable VAR, uh, consisting of some macro financial variables, as you can see here, and where the uncertainty measure is placed at the end, and then we will be using recursive identification. And in our exercise, uh, we are going to repeat it uh, four times where we replace our sector specific uncertainty measures here and then in, uh, get the IRFs. But we obviously did this for our aggregate uncertainty measure as well, uh, but the results are similar to the, their uh, macroeconomic uncertainty. So I'm not going to present them here. So what we are focusing on the sectoral side. And our conclusion is that not all uncertainty measures are alike and some sector specific uncertainties have very different real effects. And today I will focus only on the responses of the production and, and employment. So the first set of IRS shows that the responses of the production to sector specific uncertainty shocks. And as you can see, durables and energy sectors uh, generate some um, contractionary responses in the, in the production and utilities uncertainty uh, is mostly um, it's silent. So it's not really uh, react uh, affecting the production. However, one very interesting uh, result is that the non-durables uncertainty appears to be um, expansionary. So it just generates positive response in the production. We were uh, puzzled to see that because in general, the, the literature says that uncertainty should be a uh, counter cyclical and uh, contractionary. Uh, however, we can see that not all uncertainty measures are generating uh, negative effects on the production. Uh, we are we, we have we put some thought on why this is the result. Obviously, we are not backing up uh, our claims with the DSG or the theoretical macro model. But what one reconciliation could be that uh, along the lines of the irreversible uh, cost of uh, investment. So the capital cost in durables or energy sector might be much higher compared to non-durables. So it's, it's, it's cheaper to replace the cost or the investment in the non-durable sector probably. And when there is an uncertainty in the non-durable sector, maybe firms understand this as an increase in demand. And for instance, consider what happens before the hurricanes or natural disaster, or even before COVID. We all ran to the supermarkets to buy foods and uh, toilet papers that we stuck uh, in our uh, houses. So maybe that might be one reason. But this result is very robust to any specification um, and non-durable uncertainty is generating expansionary results in the production. And the results are very similar in the employment part. And again, durables and energy is contractionary, just the magnitudes are slightly different and non-durables is generating expansionary results. Now we are moving on to the COVID era where everyone's probably you know, wondering what's going on with the uncertainty. Here we are shifting the gears a little bit and then we change our uh, uh, data set to monthly frequency to capture uh, the high frequency movements in the uncertainty because a lot of things are moving very uh, high speed in during the COVID. Uh, but this means that we need to reduce our cross section because the data comes with a lag. So instead of 212, we now have 165 industries in our data set. And we are normalizing um, our uncertainty measures uh, 
with respect to the peak uncertainty during the great financial uh, crisis. And we are plotting here our aggregate uncertainty, which is the black line, uh, versus the other uh, famous uncertainty measures in the literature, which is the JLN, macroeconomic uncertainty, or their uh, element real uncertainty, economic policy uncertainty, or the weeks. So one uh, striking result here is that, yes, almost all of the uncertainty measures, they peaked around April uh, or May, and then they all declined, actually. Maybe uh, with the exception is the EPU a little bit. So it means that there is probably right now, even though there are a lot of unknowns, there are no new unknowns in the economy. That's what these measures are telling me. And it means that the uncertainty has subdued uh, starting uh, summer and the fall. And also the uh, COVID era just uh, generated twice as large uncertainties as the great financial uh, crisis. Um, but the one exception could be the VIX because VIX is looking at the more uh, financial side. So it says that the uncertainty during the Great Recession was higher, uh, but that's only from the financial point of view, which might be true, but um, those who are looking at the real side or maybe policy uncertainty, so the uncertainty is higher during the COVID. Um, five minutes, please. Okay, thank you. I'm in my last slide. So what happens to the uncertainty during the uh, sector specific side is also very interesting. Uh, first of all, we see that um, all of the uh, uncertainties peaked during the April, May again, but the peak times are different. Uh, for instance, if you look at the non-durable sector, the peak happened in April, where the peak, it started actually ri rising in March and then peaked in April, whereas the other, uh, the durables and energy, they peak, peaked at, in May. And while the difference might not be that important, it's actually very much consistent with the household spending behavior in both US and UK. Uh, these are the two examples of the papers that are looking at the household consumption in terms of their changing their behavior in the non-durables and durables um, goods. And then another thing we can say is that COVID didn't hit the utility sector much because it, the uncertainty was already elevated before that and COVID didn't rise it actually almost at all. And we also see that uncertainty in the non-durable sector, it's still elevated compared to the other uh, uh, sector specific uncertainty measures reflecting uh, the uncertainty going on in this uh, in this sector, like especially maybe food, accommodation um, or transportation sectors here. And then we know that the, during the COVID, we have um, unevenness in their recoveries. Um, this is not only happening in the first uh, moments, it's also happening in the second moments. That's what we see here. So we even have unevenness uh, in the uncertainty for each sector. Um, so as a conclusion, in this paper, we proposed a new framework for extracting aggregate and sector specific uncertainty. And we show that there are significant differences um, among different uncertainty measures. And we shed some light on the elevated uncertainty during the COVID-19 period. And we show that uh, not all of them are um, having the same real side effects. Yeah, I didn't say this during the impasse responses, but uh, clearly the durable sector was the most contractionary one. So if there is a policy uh, that needs to you know, target one of the sectoral uncertainty, it should be the aggregate one and then the, maybe the durable sector, because that's the most contractionary one. So if you can eliminate the uncertainty in the durable sector, it might help um, with the recovery. So that's the conclusion of my paper. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kareem, and great, great timekeeping um, too. So again, um, please make use of the chat box, the Q and A box, to put your questions to um, Kareem. And again, while uh, I give you all a bit of time to type your type your questions in, um, um, let me perhaps put a question to you first, please. Um, Kareem, um, since the pandemic sort of it's an empirical question which then leads on to a more open <laughs> sort of conceptual question we, we've obviously seen since the pandemic a lot of attention paid in the sort of the macroeconometric literature to how we should mo model the error and the error variance and you know I thought it's interesting you use the, uh, a fat tailed t density to, uh, in your specification so empirically I wondered what happened if you didn't assume you know what do your uncertainty measures look like if you don't allow for fat tails but say it do impose Gaussianity normality, which then leads to the more conceptual question of do we want to capture outliers when trying to measure uncertainty? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we have both set of results. It's gonna be in our robust section where we have only Gaussian errors versus where we allow the fed tails. 
the results are slightly different, but the general messages are the same. Uh, so um, I guess it's it's important to allow uh, this type of uh, like outliers because they might uh, put some biases in the stochastic volatilities. And we see that actually these uh, scaling factors are increasing slightly during the recessions. So showing that uh, maybe it's not the stochastic volatility, but it's the outlier nature in, in during the crisis. So I guess it's, it's important and there are different ways of capturing it. Uh, yeah, very good. Thanks. Thanks, Kareem. Um, I see some, some questions are, are coming in. So could we please um, unmute um, Gary Coop, please? I cannot hear you, Gary, if you're talking. No, nor can I. Let's hope Emily's working behind the scenes to... Okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. Just popped off now. Okay. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Very interesting. Um, I was just going to ask about some of the econometrics choices, and this partly overlaps with what James just asked. I was looking, for example, at um, this Carriera, Clark, and Marcelino paper in Review of exactly. Economic Statistics a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah. And you've probably seen it. They work with, like, not, you've got your sectoral data, which is quite different, different challenges, but they've got um, stochastic volatility in mean. You yes. don't. Yes. They've got normal errors. You've got student T. You've just talked about that with James. Mm -hmm. And they've got like variable specific um, um, stochastic volatilities yes. where you only have them at the sectoral level. Yes. I was just wondering, short justification for why you sort of made those choices in light of your sectoral data. Thank you. Thank you much. First of all, I'm a fan of your papers and thank you for the question. Uh, you are definitely right. They they have more bells and whistles in their model, but because their model, uh, their data is uh, or the dimensions are much smaller, so they have twenty or at most thirty variables, and that they that's how they can uh, actually uh, do that. In one of their other papers where they have slightly more variables, they they wrote specific in their paper that they couldn't allow this type of bells and whistles in their models. So when we have two hundred and twelve variables here, it's almost impossible to have the in mean stochastic volatility the in mean here or allowing idiosyncratic uh, variables. So I guess that's the biggest um, difference, the, the dimension of the data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, and we've got a question from Kanya Paramagaru, please. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions re regarding identification. So, um, you because you only have four sectors, so I was just wondering, like, how you are sure that there, you know, that you're actually capturing stuff that is sector specific and not aggregate, especially when you're uh, talking about things like utilities. Um, like, yeah, like how you can make sure that because if you had more sect or if you just had a bigger dis disaggregation of data, then you can be sure that the aggregate doesn't feed into the sector. But um, four sectors doesn't seem yeah. like a lot. And also with the VAR, you have 11 variables. Um, I was just, I don't like, I've, is that, how did you know that it wasn't over identified or do you do any tests or checks to make sure that, um, that it was okay to use 11 variables in the VAR? Thank you. Thank you, Kanya. And you're right, I think it was my mistake not to mention uh, the block uh, exogeneity here in the loadings due to the time I, we, I think I get rid of the slides and forgot to mention that. So what happens is the identification comes from the loading matrix here. So the loading of the yeah. volatilities is just a full column here so that the aggregate uncertainty is loading on all of the uh, uncertainties here. Whereas this one has a block exogeneity where we allow only the sector specific one loading on the its own sector. So that's how we identify it uh, with the block exogeneity with a lot of bunch of zero restrictions basically. Mm -hmm. But then with the lag structure here, we allow volatility spillovers uh, with a lag. But the identification comes from the block exogeneity. And in terms of the uh, JLN replication, you're definitely right. I'm not a fan of this 11 variable VAR. We are not saying that we identified uncertainty shocks. That's what the literature does. We are repeating it, but our message is here uh, slightly different and more clear, saying that whatever is right or wrong about this model, 
under the same setting, our sector specific uncertainties generate different responses and then they are very different. And we changed this 11 variable to seven variable VAR or five variable VAR. We included the both aggregate and our sector specific uncertainties. The results didn't change much. So like it changes in the peak effects maybe, but the, uh, the expansionary effect of non-durables or the contractionary effects of durables and energy, they didn't change much. Maybe we had, we got some uh, here rebound effects like in the Bloom's paper, for instance, these were the only differences in all these uh, robustness check that we did. But I agree with you, we are not saying that we really identified uncertainty shocks here by placing it in the last place. Thanks. Okay, um, thanks. Thanks, Kareem. Um, Thank you. Look, looks like that's um, it's time to move um, on. But I remind everyone that we've got the virtual um, coffee breaks. So if people have got any further questions they want to put to any of the speakers, please uh, please go hang out in the in the, <laughs> in the coffee break. So it's now over to Georgios, as it were, to um, make sure I don't waffle on too much and <laughs> in uh, in in the final presentation of this uh, session. So let me just try and share my screen. Get rid of the chat box. Okay, so hopefully everyone um, can see that. Okay, good. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is a very applied and practical um, paper. And as you can see, it's joint work with Aubrey Poon at the University of Strathclyde, who I believe is uh, uh, in this session, and also with Gianluigi Mazzi um, of Eurostat. Gianluigi's actually uh, recently retired from Eurostat, but still going strong and still doing um, <laughs> lots of uh, good work. And um, the views expressed herein are those of are, are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland or the Federal Reserve um, System. Okay, well, as, as perhaps needs uh, little motivation, um, official estimates produced by statistical offices of, of headline quarterly indeed in some countries now, monthly GDP estimates are published at, at a lag. And so what this paper is all about is trying to use uh, econometric models to try and, uh, you know, uh, get in ahead of that, that, that publication lag to produce now casts, to produce early estimates of these official um, statistical office estimates of GDP growth. Um, in this paper, we're going to have a European um, focus. So the, the, the name of the game is going to be trying to um, uh, anticipate to now cast Eurostat's um, first so-called flash estimate of quarterly GDP growth for the euro area as a whole. We're going to focus on the evolving um, composition definition of the euro area. Um, Currently, um, Eurostat publishes that quarterly GDP growth estimate for the euro area 30 days after the end of the quarter. Uh, but in fact, for many years, back to 20, 2003, when in fact Eurostat first introduced its flash estimate, these quarterly GDP growth flash estimates were produced a little more slowly um, at 45 days. So, of course, um, as we all know, policymakers and, and, and others, um, you know, eager, uh, anxious to get a more timely impression of what's going on in the economy, um, consult, you know, a myriad of different sources to get a, get a get a perhaps a higher frequency, more timely impression of what's going on in the economy. And of course, increasingly in this uh, sort of big data um, era, there are. Uh, uh, a magnitude, a plethora of these higher frequency indicators, uh, which are believed uh, purported to have some explanatory power for uh, movements in GDP growth available to the econometrician. So what this paper is going to do is via this application to the euro area is going to explore the utility of a specific uh, uh, modeling approach, which has become um, a sort of Repopularized in the since the work of Adrian Borachenko and Giannoni in 2019 in the American Economic Review. Um, their focus is very much uh, forecasting and forecasting tail risks. In this paper, we're going to be using that sort of general quantile regression method approach to produce in this sort of mixed frequency big data framework 
to produce now casts of, of euro area GDP growth, but importantly to be producing now casts of the entire density of, of euro area GDP, uh, not just um, tail risk um, forecasts. So sort of econometrically, where, where we're sort of uh, 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 trying to contribute, and this is, <laughs> this is a program of research we're carrying out, Aubrey and I and, uh, and, and others are carrying out, it, we're looking at ways that we can uh, sort of bring together the the quantile now casts, or indeed forecasts coming uh, coming from this uh, this modelling device, so as we can produce an entire density estimate um, from those. Of course, you know, um, perhaps explaining some of the uh, increased uh, popularity of quantile regression methods in recent years, certainly since this Adrian et al. paper that I just mentioned. You know, quantile regression, you know, on on the face of it, maybe an attractive way to think about modelling GDP growth, if uh, you believe there are non-linearities between the indicator variables and GDP growth. And of course, in their, their um, AER paper, Adrian et al. very much emphasised this non-linear relationship, certainly between financial conditions, financial indicators and GDP growth. And, but again, we're in a now casting context. We may well suspect um, that certain indicators, such as perhaps business confidence data, have more explanatory power for GDP growth when, you know, when it's in the tails of the distribution than when, when it's somewhere around um, um, the mean. Um, indeed, you know, if you just run a, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a relevant, I hope a relevant aside, if you run a sort of an OLS regression of GDP growth on, on a business confidence indicator, that R squared from that linear regression you know, bounces around depending on the sample period you use, but but tends to be, uh, in my experience, at least quite low. However, you can find that that business confidence indicator has a lot more explanatory power, power in the tails of the distribution. In other words, it's when something big and crazy happens, like the pandemic, which I'll turn to uh, later, that you find some sort of significance in explaining GDP growth for the uh, for the confidence indicator. And as I mentioned, econometrically, our emphasis perhaps contrasting uh, the Adrian et al work and indeed much but now not all of the work using quantile regression methods to produce nowcasts and forecast forecasts is we're going to be emphasizing construction of the full predictive density from these quantile regressions and uh, to do so we are going to propose a Bayesian quantile regression uh, nowcasting strategy um, at which accommodates the sort of three features which are well known to all of us who uh, work in the now casting field and which I've already touched on. Namely, we're going to allow for the mixed frequency um, nature of the data sets we have available. In this particular application, we, our focus is quarterly GDP growth, now casting euro area quarterly GDP growth using a large set over 100 uh, monthly indicators. But in principle, of course, and this would be a great uh, next step in our research agenda, one, one could move from monthly through to perhaps weekly indicators, as of course the New York Fed does when um, now casting or when trying to analyse the uh, movements of the economy over the pandemic period. So we'd have a mixed frequency data, we'd have the ragged edge, what, what Ken Wallace called the ragged edge uh, nature uh, uh, of, of the samples when now casting, namely the fact that the data are released to different publication um, schedules, one often has a, 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 a sort of missing values, as it were, in that last uh, row of your data matrix. And finally, um, as touched on, we and this indeed is one of the advantages of the Bayesian uh, modeling approach that we set out. We're going to allow for the, uh, uh, we're going to exploit a large range of, um, of, of monthly and indeed quarterly indicator variables when trying to now cast GDP growth. Okay, well, the, I'd say the, the, uh, the, the approach is really quite um, simple. Um, uh, the underlying specifications that we are going to consider, as you can see here, um, involve us relating the vector of monthly indicators, just captured here by um, X, to YT, that's quarterly GDP growth, but to acknowledge the monthly nature of, of, of many of these indicators, following the sort of unrestricted Midas literature, we're going to adopt a very sort of simple strategy of entering, you know, um, um, uh, the month one uh, value, uh, uh, the month one value of a variable as as x one, the month two as x two, month three as x three, um, etc. Um, of course, one um, um, 
uh, could consider various ways of parametrizing uh, that Midas specification as is popular in the more, in the wider Midas literature. But here, given our frequency mix, mix match is just quart is quarterly to monthly, we're only in a sense multiplying the number of indicators we need to model by three here in using an unrestricted Midas approach, namely not imposing any restrictions on beta one, beta two and beta three. Um, but as I'll see, we're going to in fact be using some of the shrinkage priors that I get onto later to overcome the parameter proliferation that's involved in effectively multiplying the number of indicators we've got by three. Because as, as I touched on, we're going to be considering a large set of indicators in the vector X of um, 124 monthly indicators. And in fact, in the spirit of it, it being important to try and replicate um, results, although perhaps not replicate one's own work, <laughs> um, we are going to be picking up on some earlier work that Gianluigi and I carried out um, a few years ago. So we're using the exact same um, data set as we used in this previous paper, but of course updated to the, the present day indeed through the, pan, um, through the pandemic. Um, and the monthly indicators that we're going to use when now casting your area GDP growth are going to be familiar to many of us here. So as I touched on earlier, they include business confidence data, industrial production data, which of course is monthly, and some financial market data. But importantly, uh, aware that the disaggregates may have power in explaining the aggregates, as well as including euro area business confidence, industrial production data, etc. We will include uh, the disaggregate data for the larger euro area economies. And throughout, we use real time data. Um, and this did this involve, I won't get into this now, but it did involve us having to collect some historical euro area vintage um, data. This is obviously aware of the importance of data revisions. And as I say, we're going to adopt a Bayesian estimator as a way of sort of overcoming the uh, parameter prolifer proliferation involved in this quantile type specification. Okay, I won't go into details here, but it's of course it's growing increasingly popular these days to use Bayesian methods to analyze quantile regressions. And the, the, the trick, as it were, is to note how we um, Bayesian inference can proceed by forming the likelihood using asymmetric Laplace densities. We're going to use a specific mixture representation of Kazumi and Kobashi, which reduces everything to being conditionally normal, which makes things uh, computationally more convenient. Um, and we are going to compare and contrast alternative um, six, in fact, different what different shrinkage priors on the vector of coefficients um, beta. But I note how all of these priors, one way or another, can involve us including different indicators in different parts of the GDP growth distribution. And for each of these six priors, we effectively uh, pick up the prior uh, uh, and hyperparameter choices of uh, the paper that proposed the particular uh, a prior choice and uh, estimation is in, is then relatively standard via via Gibbs sampling um, methods. We've got fuller details in the paper. But hey, let me just um, characterize the types of shrinkage prior we considered. As I said, we consider six shrinkage priors in total. Um, firstly, we consider a set of sort of lasso, adaptive lasso and elastic net type um, priors. And these, of course, are all what we often refer to now as local shrinkage priors. Adaptive lasso is a little bit more flexible because it allows for different penalization parameters on the different um, um, different uh, indicators. And the elastic net, one might hope, uh, would confer advantages when uh, when modeling with very correlated indicators, as indeed we might suspect we are here. Secondly, we consider some global local type shrinkage priors, but specifically the Horseshoe and Dirichlet Laplace priors. And these have the advantage that they, or potential advantage, particularly in so-called sparse uh, modeling um, frameworks to pick up on language of Giannoni et al, that they shrink small coefficients or uninformative indicators to zeros, but keep some fat tails to avoid over shrinkage uh, of more important indicators. And finally, but not least, we consider a SSVS um, prior, you know, the sort of George et al um, prior, which will be familiar to many of you. Okay, so we're going to be using the quantile re um, regression methods to form these now casts of um, um, uh, quarterly GDP growth. As I say, we're going to be uh, estimating using MCMC um, methods. Um, and so the having estimated the um, these quantile regressions separately for each quantile um, tau, um, the question then arises of how we should form the predictive density across the quantiles tau. Um, 
I should note in the application, we are going to be considering producing our now cast of Euro area GDP growth to two time scales. Recall Eurostat currently produced their uh, flash estimate, their sort of first official estimate of Euro area GDP growth at T plus 30 days, namely 30 days after the end of the quarter. We're going to consider bringing that forward firstly to 15 days before the end of the quarter, what we call J equals one here, and then 15 days after the end of the quarter, what we call J equals two. And remember, you know, we sort of estimate the, uh, the all of these quantile regression models recursively through the outer sample window up to cap T, up to capital T. But importantly, because the capital T plus one values of the indicator variables are known, we can exploit them when now casting the T plus one, capital T plus one uh, uh, value for, for quarterly GDP growth. I say we're going to consider in this paper, which is a topic we're currently working on, to consider alternative ways of constructing the full predictive density from the from these quantile regressions. But in this paper, we set up, consider two ways of constructing those full predictive densities. The first method is is uh, uh, involves us effectively just stacking the R MCMC draws across each of the tau. Um, um, quantile regressions. So obviously there's a, a decision to be made about what grid of quantiles to consider. In the, the majority of the paper we consider a grid of 19 quantiles from 0 0.05 through to 0.95. We have played around with that. Sorts are pretty robust but is a, in principle an important uh, uh, decision we're making. But having stacked all of the draws across each of these quantile regressions, so importantly we are allowing for parameter estimation errors in the quantile regressions. I should add in contrast to the Adrian et al classical frequentist quantile regression strategy, we then simply use a kernel to smooth across those MCMC draws. But then secondly, very much to contrast the, the uh, influential work of Adrian et al, we're going to fit a skewed T, so a specific para para parametric but skewed density to five, but we also try 19 um, conditional mean quantile forecasts. So I repeat, we've got these sort of two ways of producing the full predictive uh, density from these quantile regressions. Yeah, five so more minutes, James. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So we're going to compare the accuracy of these density now cast produced using this Bayesian quantile reg regression method with the six priors and with the two <laughs> ways of constructing the full predictive density against, as I say, in the spirit of uh, the importance of replication against the density forecast combination strategy of, of our of, of our earlier of our earlier work and um, that's an older paper I refer people to the details of that paper but that what that uh, paper involved was was effectively running separately 124 regressions of GDP growth on each of the indicators in turn constructing a, a density from each of those 124 models and then combining them up via a density forecast a density now cast combination and, and in that paper we found that density forecast combination strategy was a very effective way of now casting euro area GDP growth. So we feel that's a pretty tough uh, benchmark to compare this Bayesian quantile regression approach against. We also, in the spirit of teasing out the importance of dense versus sparse uh, data environments, will compare our Bayesian quantile regression uh, approach with some factor augmented both uh, classical quantile and linear regression methods. And, and finally, but not least, we compare against a Gaussian AR1 density. Okay, there are a lot of results in the paper, so I'm not going to give you loads of tables um, um, here, but we evaluate the point and density now casts of all the, of, of these approaches against Eurostat's first official estimate using, in fact, five evaluation metrics, root mean squared error, so focusing on the conditional mean, the average logarithmic score, the average CRPS, and two variants of the quantile weighted um, um, CRPS that emphasize either just left tail events or events in both the left and right tails. We're looking at the 5% left or the 5% left and 5% right tails. I say our evaluation sample starts in 2003 Q2 and extends for now through to just prior to the pandemic. And um, as I, in a second, I'll just summarize our results of what we find when we do run the models through the through the 2020 and its extreme data realizations. But in summary, uh, we find that the Bayesian quantile regression with the global local truck priors, specifically the horseshoe prior in particular, dominates. It produces the most accurate now cast 
at both horizons, so both at t minus 15 and t plus 15 days, according to all five of these evaluation metrics. So it does really well. And importantly, it outperforms the density forecast combinations of our earlier work, and it outperforms any of these factor augmented linear or quantile regression methods. So again, suggestive of a sparse rather than dense data set. So it's a, it's a, a strong result. But the choice of prior in the Bayesian quantile regression method matters, and it matters a lot. Some of the prior choices, particularly such as the elastic net, really do quite badly and produce quite, quite far too sort of wide <laughs> um, densities. You know, we experimented with hyperparameter choices to try and see if we can uh, uh, improve the performance of some of these prior specifications, uh, but have been um, unable to. But as I say, the global local priors work really well. Using a skewed T as proposed by Adrian et al does not work as well as using the MCMC draw. So in terms of the sort of the, the specific question of how should one construct the quant density now casts forecast from quantile regressions, we find it's better to work off the MCMC draws, allow for parameter estimation uncertainties, rather than use the skewed T focusing on the conditional mean parameter estimates. And as we might hope, we find accuracy is indeed better if you are willing to wait 30 days more for the arrival of additional within quarter indicated data. So we just end with a couple of um, little pictures to try and tease out what's going on both before the pandemic and then finally um, um, get, um, end by just briefly talking about what we're finding about how the models work over the pandemic um, period. Well, firstly, I'm going to focus on the horseshoe prior here, which, as I said, is our preferred, is the sort of the dominant, the empirically best performing way of producing the Euro area uh, um, now cast, density now cast. And as you can see, looking at the period pre-pandemic, particularly the period of the, of the global financial crisis, the Bayesian quantile regression method, looking at its the four moments of its density, does a good job in the mean of tracking the GDP outturn. But one can also see, looking at the uh, higher moments, we do see variations over time, temporal variation in those in those moments. So it's, it's acknowledging the flexible nature of, of quantile regressions. Um, see the uncertainty rise during the global financial crisis and fall um, thereafter. The evidence is a bit mute, interestingly, relating to the. Uh, the wider literature on whether GDP growth is skewed or not, the evidence is a bit muted, uh, to say the least, about whether there are dominant downside risks to GDP growth. In fact, as you can see, a lot of the time we're finding skewness is on the positive side rather than the negative um, side, as emphasised by um, Adrian et al. We also look at the probability of negative GDP growth, growth at risk, as popularised by Adrian et al. and now the um, IMF. Um, and, you know, in short, the encouraging feature we, we see here is, that, of course, all these estimates are produced as if in real time, using the real time data of integers. So there's no kind of look ahead bias here. We can see that particularly the horseshoe type prior um, is doing a good job. Its probabilities of a one pit quarter <laughs> recession of negative GDP growth do indeed rise quite rapidly, as you can see here. And quite early on with the onset of the global financial crisis, they do quite a good job of tracking what's going on. We see some of the there are some sort of uh, uh, also pick up this little trough in sort of 2013 and fall thereafter. We can see some of the other prior specifications effectively are always a little bit, uh, the densities are far too wide. And as a result, they always attribute far too uh, higher probability to a uh, recession. So the choice of prior and indeed the hyperparameter choices do indeed matter. Finally, um, but not least, let me sort of end by. Uh, um, talking about how what happens when we extend our out of sample evaluation over the period of COVID-19. Um, Again, you can see focusing on the probability of negative GDP growth um, from the six different um, prior specification choices for the uh, uh, Bayesian quantile regression, comparing it with the, uh, what I've called a linear opinion pool, that's the density forecast combination method. And of course, the story in the euro area was of, of, of a big fall, like in the US, like in the UK, it was a big fall in, in Q2 of GDP growth, then a big bounce back in Q3. And encouraging, you can see that the horseshoe prior, whether at 15 days after or before the end of the quarter, does a good job of picking up both the fall and then the, uh, the rise in GDP growth um, thereafter, unlike some of the other prior specification choices. Um, but one might have hoped that um, this 4% fall of GDP growth in Q1 would have been picked up by these by our Bayesian quantile regression method. You can see it's not. So 4% looks small relative to this whopper of a fall in Q2. But of course, 4% historically is still a big fall in GDP growth. And you can see our, 
our preferred horseshoe prior Bayesian quantile regression me method attributes a, a close to zero probability of that event happening. So on the face of it, that looks like kind of bad news for our methodology. But recall, even 15 days after the end of the quarter, so effectively we were trying to now cast euro area uh, Q1 GDP growth in mid-April. Um, so by that point, um, yes, the euro area had gone into lockdown. It went to lockdown in mid-March, of course. But for example, the industrial production data, which did tank in March, aren't, aren't published until later on in, in, in April. So one can begin to perhaps uh, appreciate that given our choice to only go as high frequency as monthly here, that perhaps this feature that the horseshoe prior is unable to pick up the fall in economic activity in the second half of March is not surprising. And perhaps we shouldn't really expect our models to be picking up that fall unless they graduated to consideration of higher frequency, perhaps even weekly or daily um, data. As I say, in short, we find that the Bayesian quantile regressions with these global local priors um, are, are perhaps a, uh, a good uh, uh, you know, way of thinking about how to produce density now cost of euro area GDP growth, importantly, including uh, uh, over periods uh, characterized by these two big shocks, firstly, the global financial crisis, and then finally, the COVID pandemic. Okay, let me um, stop there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, James. Um, I encourage participants to enter questions in the Q&A. In the meantime, I have two very low key questions. Um, the first one is you had the slide where you, uh, where you summarize your results and where you found that um, the most accurate is the BQR. And so my low key question is how should I interpret this most accurate, uh, this assessment of most accurate quantitatively relative to the, to the, to the competitors? Good question, because I certainly didn't give you the tables, but uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the tables of results are indeed, uh, I promise, um, uh, in the paper, which is on my website and, and on Aubrey's <laughs> as, as, as well. But we, um, this statement that the Bayesian quantile regression, importantly with the global local prior, so either the horseshoe or the Dirichlet Laplace, in fact, the ranking of the prior choice is horseshoe first, then Dirichlet Laplace um, second. This statement is informed by uh, comparing the accuracy of the uh, specific model against the density forecast combination approach and the auto regression according to each of these five evaluation metrics um, listed here. So in fact, the uh, as I did summarize, but it will be very quickly and I appreciate that giving you the specific, uh, got some big tables in the, in the paper, that it's the horseshoe prior uh, is produces um, uh, more accurate forecast than the AR, according to all five of these evaluation metrics, and indeed is more accurate than any of the other uh, specifications we consider. And indeed, the gains relative to the AR are often sort of a, a pretty pretty sizable gains of sort of 40, 50% um, when we look at the ratio, let's say, of the CRPS from the <laughs> from the Bayesian quantile regression relative to the CRPS of the benchmark um, um, model. But we were also, I was also somewhat a bit, you know, so you may know I'm a big fan of density forecast combinations. I found them to be a very flexible way of producing now casts, density now casts and forecasts. You know, these sort of mixture distributions are very flexible, a little bit non-parametric in spirit, like a quantile regression. And I was actually initially sort of somewhat surprised, but I've, I've learned to live with it. Maybe this is good, <laughs> that the Bayesian quantile regressions with the horseshoe prior, so one of the global, or, or at least the Dirichlet Laplace prior, were competitive indeed outperformed these density forecast combination methods. Thank That's you. Impressive. Thank you. Uh, we have, so I'll defer my second question because I see that we have questions in the Q&A. Emily, could we please unmute Gary Koop? Hi, James. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I just want to sort of explore a little bit more. One of the issues you emphasized a lot, prior choice matters. Um, an interesting extension to your approach might be to allow for different priors at different tows. So it's possible, say, the horseshoe works well in the upper tails, something else works differently in the lower tails or whatever. Is that sort of of interest, or do you find the horseshoe, say, uniformly does best at every quantile? Great question. Not something we've considered, but we 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 could, and indeed we um, we should. So the results uh, uh, we've presented here, indeed that are in the paper, are using are using a specific prior choice across all tau, in part reflecting our 
emphasis on constructing the full predictive density from the quantile regression rather than looking at performance as, at a specific um, quantile. But you're right, it may well be, and it's been an interesting thing to explore, that certain prior choices and hyperparameter choices work better at certain in certain regions, as it were, of the density. So I agree, I mean, in principle, what one could do, um, you know, like a sort of different ways one could go about it, but one thought that comes to mind straight away is that you, you know, at a given quantile, you, um, um, you could do this uh, uh, recursively, so not looking without looking ahead bias, you know, you look for at a given tau, look for the, uh, or select the best performing uh, prior specification. Um, and you do that for each tau, and then construct the, the, the uh, predictive density from at each tau the preferred prior prior choice. So, so you wouldn't it wouldn't be the predictive now cast from the horseshoe prior anymore because it might be the horseshoe in at some tau and the Jewish lady plus or something else at other tau. But I agree that's a nice suggestion and something that we should look into to lend further flexibility to um, to this approach. Yeah, thank you. Good good idea, Gary. <laughs> and then we have another question, uh, Emily. Can we please unmute Martin Wheel? Thank you very much, James. That was very interesting. I was wondering what shape, whether it's possible to say what sort of shape you got for the density using the MCMC, <clears throat> because I mean, you say it's not as good as I mean, you say it's better than skewed T, but how does it act? Can you say how it differs from skewed T? Because I mean, here you've got skewness and you've got ketosis. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good question again, Martin. I was trying to remember whether I certainly haven't um, uh, apologised presented to you here today any densities at a specific point in time, so you can sort of really <laughs> appreciate what these densities look like. As you can, as 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 you as you can see here, what I uh, focused on here is just the sort of temporal evolution in these four moments of the densities from this Bayesian uh, quantile regression with the horseshoe prior. Um, what I haven't got off the top, I haven't, I haven't got the results here, here and now to compare and contrast with what the skewness and or what the moments indeed the any of the first four moments of the skewed T specification fitted to the Bayesian quantile regression are. So in fact, that I think even in the paper, whilst we've got some pictures, one thing we don't do, which I, I think your question sort of <laughs> encouraging us to do is to um, obviously the uh, in fitting the kernel to the MCMC draws, the predictive densities that we get out can indeed, as we do share in the paper, but you can't see from this uh, particular slide I appreciate, can be quite funky. In other words, there can be multimodalities, as indeed has been emphasized in some of the more recent work of Domenico uh, Giannone and co-authors. Um, by contrast, of course, as, 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 uh, as I know you know very well, the skewed T, whilst it allows for skewness, whilst it allows for fat tails, is a unimodal um, density. So one interesting thing to explore, particularly given this heightened interest, particularly post-pandemic in multimodalities, would be to kind of turn on and off <laughs> the kind of uni-multimodality um, in our, in our, in the way we construct the predictive densities from the MCMC draws to kind of see, to let us better answer your question. In other words, so we can sort of compare and contrast where are the gains from this more flexible way of fitting uh, uh, of constructing the density relative to the skewed T um, coming from. Is it because we're getting um, uh, very different uh, skewed uh, skew and ketosis coefficients, for example, or is it or is it because actually we're getting quite funky, perhaps multimodal, bimodal densities, which of course by construction the skewed T um, can't get. So I see there's some more work we need to do, Martin, which is which is good. So thank you for the question, and that's certainly. Sorry, can we've... I ask follow on? Yep. How many modes do you typically have? I mean, I can see that being bimodal, you might be perfectly comfortable with, but uh, you know, having a mode at each quintile point, well, you wouldn't get that, but I would worry if I had a lot of modes. Yeah, no, in, in, indeed. And in fact, some ongoing work that Aubrey and I are carrying out with Dan Zhu, in fact, of, of uh, University of Melbourne, where we find that it's the evidence of that the debt predictive densities from this this estimator um based on quantile regression method the predictive densities now casts um are unimodal most of the time they become bimodal or the increasing evidence of, of at least some sort of <laughs> peak in in the, particularly in the left tail in recessionary periods as one might expect and indeed this in fact accords with the 
uh, more recent work of Domenico Gioni, so Adrian Borachenko and Giannone that was um, that's forthcoming in the International Economic Review, where they where they too find so our our work's Euro area, not not U US, and we've got a now casting, not forecasting focus, and we're using a different econometric methodology. But empirically, we seem to be finding similar things that the predictive densities are pretty unimodal, but it can be fat tailed, there can be some skew um, in should we say more normal times, but in abnormal, particularly recessionary times evidence of uh, bimodalities um, does emerge and I repeat that's what we do find with our um, with this sort of our preferred <laughs> uh, MCMC way of constructing the predictive densities from the quantile regressions. Thank you. Okay thanks a lot I see that we're <laughs> exactly on time so that's very good so let me also thank all presenters and attendees to join the session. Uh, and uh, again, uh, please be encouraged to join the coffee breakout rooms, uh, which can be accessed by the lecture rooms uh, section of the platform. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye.